on world news tonight. Scare subsides. The state of Kerala returns to normalcy after the Nipah virus that claimed the lives of dozens. Visa exempted. Thailand welcomes Chinese tourists on the first day of visa-free entry scheme. Opened again. North Korea reopens borders completely after an extended COVID lockdown. And race for glory. Adorable wiener dogs compete for the top dog trophy in Cincinnati. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We are kicking off tonight's coverage in India where life is resuming back to normal and restrictions are easing in Kerala as Nipah virus cases decline in the state. For the past few weeks, an outbreak of infectious infections due to Nipah virus had led to the closing of schools and educational institutions in Kerala. Six cases of the Nipah virus have been found so far in the state of Kerala, in which two persons died, while four others, including a nine-year-old boy, are under treatment. The health minister said that ICMR and WHO, who conducted studies and found the Kerala and eight other states in India, have probability of Nipah occurrence. Kerala Chief Minister Piniari Vijayan has said that the state will conduct a seroprevalence study on the Nipah virus being repeatedly found in Kozikode district. According to WHO, population-based Seroprevalence surveys are conducted to predict the proportion of infection and immunity in order to comprehend disease burden and pattern of transmission and associated risk factors. Nipah virus is a zoonotic virus that can spread from animals to humans as well as humans to humans. To prevent contracting it, people should avoid eating fruits that may be infected with bats and wash their hands frequently. While the infection is not rapidly spread, it can be deadly once contracted. Nipah virus mainly attacks the lungs and brain. It may also lead to respiratory issues such as cough and sore throat or even rapid breathing, fever and gastrointestinal problems like nausea and vomiting. It can lead to seizures and disorientation and can even cause comas or death. Nipah virus infection is rare but can be severe, especially in children. They must follow appropriate preventative methods to avoid getting the virus. Treatment is mainly supportive as there is no availability of specific antiviral therapy, so preventive measures should be followed adequately. Top Thai officials welcomed hundreds of Chinese tourists at Bangkok's International Airport. It was the first day of a new visa-free entry program that officials say will boost the country's tourism industry that was badly damaged by the coronavirus pandemic. Thailand rolled out the red carpet for the first batch of visa-free Chinese tourists landing in Bangkok on Monday. Prime Minister Shweta Toysin personally greeted them after the country waived visas for Chinese nationals to boost the tourism industry. Dancers in traditional costumes and puppeteers put on performances for the bemused visitors who came in on a flight from Shanghai. Tourism is a crucial driver of Southeast Asia's second largest economy. And one of the newly elected prime minister's priority is to revive an industry that was hard hit by the global health crisis. He hopes it can boost the whole country. <laughs> We don't only intend to boost the economy for big cities like Chiang Mai, Bangkok, Pattaya or Phuket. There's been a discussion with the Tourism Authority Governor that we will also be promoting tourism for secondary cities more, so that tourists stay longer in Thailand and thus spend more. The visa waiver program runs from September 25th until February next year. It makes it easier to enter the country. The government expects 2.88 million Chinese visitors during that five-month period, well up on the 2.34 million Chinese who have visited this year. Before the pandemic, China was the largest source of tourists for Thailand. The country accounted for 11 million arrivals out of a record 39.9 million tourists in 2019. They spent over $53 billion in the country. Monday's arrivals seem to welcome the new policy. In the past, the visa on arrival still needed us to provide some mandatory documents. But if we're visa-free, it's just like when I go through customs and they only had to stamp my passport and register my fingerprints. I think it's really efficient and convenient. So far this year, 
Thailand has welcomed 19 million visitors. The Speaker of Canada's House of Commons, Anthony Rota, has apologized for praising a Ukrainian man who served in a Nazi unit during World War II. And I'm deeply sorry that I have offended many uh, in my, with my gesture and remarks. That's the Speaker of Canada's House of Commons apologizing for praising an individual at a parliamentary meeting who served in a Nazi unit during World War II. On Friday, during a visit by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, Speaker Anthony Roda recognized 98-year-old Yaroslav Hunka as a, quote, Ukrainian hero. Hunka served in World War II as a member of the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS. That's according to the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, a Jewish human rights group that demanded an apology on Sunday. Rota acknowledged Hunka after a speech by Zelensky praising the World War II veteran for fighting for Ukrainian independence against the Russians. Even at his age of 98. Hunka received two standing ovations from lawmakers. In his apology, Rota said he alone was responsible. No one, including you, my fellow parliamentarians, or Ukraine, the Ukraine delegation, was privy to my remarks prior to their delivery. In Parliament, reaction came quickly from the government. I think it's been deeply embarrassing for Canada, and I think it was deeply embarrassing for the president of the Ukraine, who came here in friendship and members of the opposition. It was profoundly hurtful for so many Canadians and, and to people around the world. And he has to step down as a consequence of that. Hunka could not be reached for comment. Now, ethnic Armenians living in the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh began evacuating from the enclave. Just days after Azerbaijan launched a rapid offensive to retake the territory, prompting local fighters to agree to a ceasefire. At the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, cars and trucks arrive one by one, packed with displaced families fleeing Nagorno-Karabakh like the majority of the enclave's population. At the border, people anxiously wait for their relatives to arrive. How can we go back? Our Karabakh will no longer exist. There is no help from any country. No country speaks for us. Exhausted from their journey, they register with the Red Cross inside these tents, are given food and drink before heading for towns across the region, like Goris, just 25 kilometers away. This mountain town has welcomed thousands of refugees. The local theater is being used as a temporary shelter. But Goris is only a transit point. Many are lost, not knowing where to go next, still in shock and grieving over what they've left behind. We took our children and left our homes to come here to find refuge, a new home. Our nation has been sold by a government that does not know what it's doing. The Armenian government says it's prepared to take in 40,000 displaced families. Charity groups are working round the clock to help meet this target. Of course, I feel quite overwhelmed because the situation is quite difficult. They are arriving like a lot of refugees, and I'm not sure if our country is quite ready for that. And uh, we, as a fund, we're trying to help refugees as much as and as fast as possible. Humanitarian aid will become more and more urgent as authorities expect an influx of refugees in the coming days. To election updates on the road to the White House. A new poll found voters have concerns about President Biden's age and health as he runs for re-election in 2024. 
Joe Biden is already the oldest president in American history. If he is re-elected in 2024, he would be 86 at the end of his second term in office. Hello, hello, hello. Tonight, the major new warning signs for President Good Biden's re-election bid. Polling shows 74% of registered voters have major or moderate concerns that the president does not have the mental and physical health necessary to serve a second term. It comes as the administration's opponents raise questions about the 80-year-old commander-in-chief's fitness to serve after a string of incidents. On Saturday, the president mistaking the name of rap superstar LL Cool J while honoring him at an event. And two of the great artists of our time representing the groundbreaking legacy of hip-hop in America, LLJ Cool J. Uh... And earlier in the week, accidentally praising the Congressional Black Caucus at a speech delivered to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. My dad used to say, everyone, everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. The Congressional Black Caucus embodies all those values. From stumbling on stage to tripping outside Air Force One, the president's opponents have sought to highlight his missteps as evidence his age is a liability. But Mr. Biden has pointed to his experience and has tried to disarm the issue with humor. I got elected to the Senate when I was 29 years old. I had to wait 17 days to be eligible. That was 827 years ago, but it was a while. <laughs> The White House today brushing off the poll. I get the polling that you're laying out. I get that, but we we can't we can't be focused on that. We also have to be focused on really speaking directly to the American people. On the major issues, the polling is also dire for the president. 56% of voters disapprove of the job he's doing, the highest of his term. 59% of voters disapprove of his handling of the economy. America has the strongest economy in the world. A new Washington Post poll shows 62 percent disapprove of his work on the southern border. They continue to undermine our border security today, blocking bipartisan reform. And nearly 60 percent of Democrats tell end pollsters they want someone to challenge the president in the Democratic primary, despite no viable challengers emerging. Mr. Biden now locked in a dead heat with a Republican primary frontrunner, Donald Trump, 46 points apiece. Welcome back. We have some more updates for you from the U.S. now as the federal government is set to shut down in just four days unless Congress passes a stopgap funding bill. Some Americans will face tough consequences if a shutdown does happen. At a Washington warehouse, volunteers are preparing for the practical impact of the political impasse looming five miles south on Capitol Hill. We know that when budgets are stretched, food is the first thing to go. The Capital Area Food Bank is now planning for a possible surge of 100,000 people in the D.C. region needing food assistance soon if the government shuts down this weekend. Think about the cleaning crews, the food service, you know, those who have food trucks outside of, you know, of um, government buildings and, and offices. A shutdown would divide some four million federal employees nationwide into two groups, essential workers, including active duty military, border patrol and air traffic controllers expected to keep reporting for work and furloughed workers simply sent home. Neither would see a paycheck until the government reopens. We're doing a lot of um, belt tightening. Wisconsin's Social Security claims specialist and single mom, Jessica LaPointe, expects to work without pay. A shutdown would also slow services like food safety inspections and applications for passports and small business loans. The White House claims 10,000 kids would immediately lose access to Head Start and funding for WIC, a nutrition program that helps low-income women and young children, would dry up within days. Members of Congress, who will continue to be paid, have until midnight Saturday to strike a deal. Kosovo police units moved in to secure and search a village in North Kosovo after four people were killed in a shootout between police and ethnic Serb gunmen in the resistive region. Kosovo police moved in to secure and search a village in northern Kosovo on Monday after a shootout between police and ethnic Serb gunmen that left four people dead. Police recovered a cache of weapons and military equipment during the operation 
and a search of houses in the village continued as armed police looked for any gunmen who may not have fled. The group of heavily armed attackers stormed the village of Banska on Sunday, battling police and barricading themselves into a Serbian Orthodox monastery. Police retook the monastery later that day. Three attackers and one police officer died in the gunfight. The United States has condemned attacks on police and urged the governments of Kosovo and Serbia to defuse tensions. Meanwhile, Russia said it was closely monitoring what it called a potentially dangerous situation. Russia does not recognize Kosovo as an independent country and traditionally supports Serbia. Ethnic Albanians make up a majority of Kosovo's 1.8 million people, but some 50,000 Serbs in the north of the former Serbian province do not accept Kosovo's 2008 declaration of independence. They see Belgrade as their capital, more than two decades after a Kosovo-Albanian guerrilla uprising against Serbian rule. Here's Kosovo's Prime Minister, Albin Korti. From yesterday, nothing can be the same anymore. The facts came out right in front of us, in our eyes and in the eyes of the international community, as well as in the eyes of everyone who has the courage and will to see the truth of the region in which we live. Korti has blamed Serbia for financing and sending armed men to Kosovo, a claim Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic denies. Vucic blames Korti for inciting violence by refusing to form an association of Serb municipalities to allow Serbs more autonomy and by launching frequent police actions in the north. Tensions have been running high since clashes in northern Kosovo in May, when more than 90 NATO peacekeeping soldiers and some 50 Serb protesters were injured in northern Kosovo. North Korea's borders, which had been closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, have now been completely opened after more than three and a half years. Foreigners are now allowed to enter, but they must undergo a two-day quarantine upon arrival. North Korea's borders are now fully reopened, some three years and eight months since the regime was completely sealed up due to the COVID-19 outbreak. According to Chinese state media outlet CCTV, starting Monday, North Korea has started allowing entry for foreigners. Without specifying the source of the announcement, CCTV reported that authorities in Pyongyang lifted the border closure with the requirement of a two-day quarantine period upon arrival. The regime has shown movement towards opening its borders for the past few months. In July, it allowed the entry of delegations from China and Russia and also allowed its citizens living abroad to return home last month in an easing of antivirus measures and border controls. Plans to reopen were also evident in terms of policymaking. Last month, North Korea adopted a new law to revitalize its tourism industry. It addresses issues including expanding both domestic and international tourism and ensuring convenience for tourists. Also earlier this month, North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un traveled to Russia for a summit with President Vladimir Putin and North Korean athletes who are participating at the Hangzhou Asian Games have traveled to China. Regarding the reopening of North Korea's borders, during its briefing on Monday, the U.S. Department of State reaffirmed its commitment to diplomacy with the regime, stating that the Biden administration has consistently welcomed and been open to dialogue with North Korea, which Pyongyang has rejected. Now, Hollywood's bitter months-long labor dispute has taken a big first step towards a resolution. The Writers Guild of America got most of what it wanted. With actors still on picket lines, however, much of Hollywood will remain shut down. Late night and daytime talk show producers were making plans to return to TV screens for the first time in five months on Monday after Hollywood writers reached a tentative deal to end a work stoppage that had shut down production. The Writers Guild of America, which represents more than 11,000 film and television writers, reached a preliminary three-year deal with major studios on Sunday. Sean McNulty is a contributor at The Ankler. Look, there's a sense of relief. It really is, you know, as much as the it's been contentious and there's still a lot of bad feelings probably on, on both sides, certainly on the talent side. Um, you can't see this as anything less than a positive step in the right direction. The agreement still must be approved by the union's leadership and members. Meanwhile, actors are still on strike, 
scripted series will not be able to resume filming until the SAG-AFTRA Actors Union reaches an agreement with studios, with pay raises and the use of AI on screen being major sticking points. They have a bigger, uh, you know, ask uh, on pay raises than the other two guilds had. Um, so an AI is a much arguably a bigger issue for an actor to a degree than maybe even a writer uh, or maybe just as big. Uh, but it's a different set of parameters of protections that they need. So whatever the whatever the writers got for AI, it may apply, but it may not be apples for apples to sag. So and these negotiations take, you know, as we saw with the WGA, you just don't know how it's going to go. As I wrote in my newsletter this morning, you'd be an optimist and maybe we're done with this by early November or a pessimist and this will be going until easily till December. So we'll see how it goes. Shares of big media companies lost ground on Monday with Warner Brothers Discovery and Walt Disney ending lower at the close. Welcome back. A new war is looming as the Karabakh conflict drags on. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least 20 people were killed and hundreds were injured in an explosion at a fuel depot in Azerbaijan's Nagorno-Karabakh. Canadian Sikhs staged small protests outside India's diplomatic missions after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said there may be a link between New Delhi and the murder of a Sikh separatist advocate in British Columbia. Authorities said that heavy rains caused a river in Guatemala's capital to burst its banks, killing at least six people and leaving 13 others missing. Sea ice that packs the ocean around Antarctica hit record low levels this winter, adding to scientists' fears that the impact of climate change at the southern pole is ramping up. India won the women's cricket tournament at the Asia Games as they beat Sri Lanka by 19 runs to claim their first gold medal in the sport at the Continental Showpiece. And that is all we have for you on World News this Tuesday night. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in Cincinnati, USA, as Dashing Dashens completed for Top Dog at the annual running of the Wiener Dogs. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.